epigenetic influence involves the fact that there are multiple genes, perhaps an unknown number of different genes that contribute to an outcome or behavior. And most psychological traits are polygenic, meaning that there are, there's more than one, probably many dozens or hundreds of genes that are involved with traits like intelligence or uh, negative emotionality or certain personality traits. So that, that's, that contrasts with M Mendelian inheritance, we call it, where just one gene causes a trait. Like there are certain syndromes that are caused by a single mutation. But that's rarely, if, if, if ever, the case for a psychological phenomena. Really powerful tools to disentangle the influences of environment and uh, genetic makeup on phenotypes, phenotypic traits like behavior and disorders. And there's, there's two main types of family studies. We have twin and adoption studies. The adoption studies are actually a little more powerful because you have members of the same family who are genetically unrelated. It could be that you are adopted by a parent, or it could be that you can look and see how similar you are to your adoptive parent versus how similar you are to your biological parent. And that's assuming that uh, we can track down your biological parent. Or we can just look at the resemblance between you and your adoptive parents because obviously you're not going to be related to them. It actually gets even more powerful when you're adopted to a family that already has siblings. So you might have an adoptive brother or sister who's the biological offspring of your adoptive parents. And so we can compare how similar are you as the adoptee to your parents who are adopted compared to your siblings' parents who are their biological parents. And if we find that you as the adoptee are related to your adoptive sibling or adoptive parents, that is telltale evidence of shared environmental influence or family-wide environmental influence. It can't be due to any genetic effects that would make you similar to your adopted family members. The logic of a twin study is, is somewhat different. In this case, you have generally we have twins that are reared together in the same home since birth, and we compare dizygotic or fraternal twins to monozygotic or identical twins. So dizygotic twins are no more related genetically than any ordinary um, full sibling would be to one another. So they share some genes, but they also have different genes. And the idea is that if fraternal twins don't resemble one another to the same extent as identical twins resemble one another, then that's evidence that there's genetic influence at work. Fraternal twins share more of the shared environment than regular siblings, right? Because they're infants at the same time. Yes, there can be a, a special twin environment. Um, for example, they share the same prenatal environments. Uh, they're in the womb at the same time and their mom. So, that, so there, that could be a special twin environment that they share that non-twin uh, siblings wouldn't share. So it turns out if you have a family member, especially a first degree relative with a certain disorder, that might confer a generalized risk in you to develop maybe not the same disorder, but a, another related disorder. And that's what we call comorbidity. It's the phenomenon by which if, if, if a person has a certain disorder, um, they're more, more likely than not to have a, another disorder. And, and a lot of different disorders involve similar not necessarily just symptoms, but similar uh, risk factors. And so what we can do is we can compare, we can compare you to a family member who, who, who has a disorder. And let's say they have depression. Not only will you, will you be at higher risk for depression, we also be at higher risk for anxiety disorders and, uh, and vice versa. And the reason is because there's um, this, this, general negative emotionality that cuts across a lot of different disorders. I mean, look at personality disorders such as borderline or um, avoided personality disorder. That also involves 
feelings of inadequacy and you know of, of um, you know pessimism and the anger and alienation and, and frustration that's shared in common with major depression that's shared in common with a variety of different anxiety disorders and it's the environmental cues and environmental factors might differentiate might determine whether a person has um, a specific phobia versus say post-traumatic stress disorder versus generalized anxiety disorder versus panic disorder so there's a general negative emotionality that describes all disorders and it could be that there's specific environmental effects that cause a person to manifest one disorder versus another so so these are molecular genetic techniques to understand the influence of genes which is which are different from the more quantitative family studies where you're not actually looking at any specific genes you're just inferring the effects of genes by comparing um, relationships across different family members. In, 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 um, in genome-wide association studies and candidate gene studies, you're involved, you involve people who are unrelated to one another. You look at a bunch of people, generally, you know, the more the merrier, it could be thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people that are genotyped. And with a genome-wide association study, you come into the study with a very open mind, you don't have any preconceptions of what genes might be involved with the trait in interest of interest and you just look you, you say what what polymorphisms what what alleles are correlated more than chance with the behavior so let's say you're interested in psychotic traits right and you measure you try to measure psychosis in a, in a dimensional way Right, or maybe you measure depressive symptomatology and you, and you say, are there genes that represent higher risk for depression? And what you do is you measure depressive symptoms in everyone, it could be thousands of people, and you genotype them and then you look at what genes are correlated or, or associated with, with the outcome. And, and you look at maybe uh, hundreds of thousands of different uh, genes, or alleles rather, not genes or SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms. These are different variants of genes. Well, and so the difference between an allele and a gene is that an allele is the term for different versions of the same gene? Exactly. We have hundreds of thousands, maybe you know, millions of different types of variation in our, in our um, genotype. Cool, so would you mind just, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so were you gonna ask about the uh, the candidate gene studies. Okay, so the difference between that and genome-wide is here with candidate genes, we have an a priori hypothesis of what gene is gonna be related to the behavior. So from a theoretical standpoint, we expect, say, a, a certain gene to have a functional effect on that behavior. And so we only look at that one gene or, or two or three genes and say, do people who have a disease, are they more likely to be a carrier of this mutation? And so you're not looking at things in, from, from an agnostic perspective. You're not just taking hundreds of thousands of different uh, polymorphisms and saying, okay, I'm just, I want to see what, if, if, if anything is related to, to depression. Here we have an idea that, oh, genes related to the serotonin transporter are going to be related to depression. So let's just look at that one candidate gene and see if it's associated with depression. That's a great question. And there's, there's a couple of reasons why some of these deleterious genes or mutations are so pervasive. Well, one thing is that a lot of times genes interact with one another to influence a person's phenotype. In other, in other words, there could be recessiveness at play where you have a combination of two alleles an allele is an alternative variant of a gene and you know you get one allele from your, your mother and one from your father and it's by having both both of these recessive alleles from your parents causes you to develop a disease but whereas if you're only a carrier if you only have one copy of the of the harmful mutation you don't show any impairment so that's, that's one reason why, why uh, certain genes or mutations 
that are harmful can maintain in the gene pool. Another reason is that a lot of times there's a developmental unfolding of the effects of this gene. So a lot of times there, there are certain diseases like Huntington's, uh, multiple sclerosis. A lot of these genes actually don't affect the person until they get older. Like let's say they enter middle adulthood. So when they're a young adult, when they're, when they're um, breeding, you know, finding partners and you know, having children, they don't show any of, uh, negative effects of the genes, but only when they're older, well after they, they finished um, reproducing, in fact, probably maybe already raised their children to adulthood, that's when they, the disease manifests. And so the genes that affect these diseases that are later onset, like Huntington's, are not gonna be weeded out. That's a great question. And what are some examples of, of phenomena that you're thinking about? I, you're probably thinking of depression, right? Um, eating disorders, uh, conduct problems. You know, a lot of them really become prominent starting at around puberty. And there probably were some antecedents that maybe were dormant before that, but, but they really start shining out um, in early adolescence. And I would say it might, might be because there's just a lot more complexity socially in our life, and they're not being handheld as much by teachers and parents, and so they're more on their own, they're more kind of creating the, their own environment for themselves, which can be stressful. And so the buffer, the, the, the family environmental buffer that they had before is now, it's fading. It's not as strong. And so a lot of their psychopathology is more likely to be revealed while they're exploring their new adolescent identity. And it could be, it could be uh, compounded by the hormonal changes that are occurring. 